News of the Times, Frightful Fridays, The Cropton Murders. Welcome to News of the Times. In today's episode, it is 1872 near Pickering in North Yorkshire. Joseph Wood and his young son Joseph Thompson, illegitimate, have vanished. Joseph Wood, with his 80-acre farm, is a known eccentric. It is whispered that he keeps large amounts of cash around the house. His disappearance is questioned, but a letter purportedly from Joseph, postmarked as coming from Liverpool, states that he and his young son have left, and whilst he is away, his cousin Richard Charter is to run the farm. And so things remain until the discovery of clothing and body parts begin to be discovered. Worse still, bones of a young lad are found in the pig pen, clearly gnawed on by the pigs. We explore the background, crime and capture of the Cropton murderer in today's episode of Frightful Fridays. We hope you enjoy the show. Background The Wood family were a well-established family near Pickering in North Yorkshire. Joseph Wood had inherited his 80-acre farm located on Cropton Lane from his uncle. He had been a farmer for 37 years and was quite successful. Within the community, he was highly respected and known to have a good business sense, but he was also known as an eccentric. One of his eccentricities was to have large sums of money in and around the house. Joseph's family included four brothers and three sisters. One of his brothers, John, had his own farm at the far end of Cropton Lane. Joseph had had a decades-long relationship with his housemaid, Catherine Thompson. Together, they'd had three children. Catherine died from illness in 1870. At the time of Joseph's disappearance, his middle child, Joseph Thompson, the youngest Thompson, William, was residing with him. In a nearby village was the farm of Robert Charter, 53, a little over two miles away from his cousin Joseph's farm at Cropton Lane. Robert lived there with his wife and their three grown-up children. Robert was known to go the short distance to cousin Joseph's farm to help when needed. On those occasions, the care of Robert's own farm came under the supervision of his son-in-law, William Hardwick. The Disappearance on or about the 13th of May, 1871, Joseph Wood and his middle son, Joseph Thompson, aged about eight years old, vanished. Joseph's brother, in going to visit the farm, found instead cousin Robert Charter running the farm. When asked where his brother Joseph was, Robert responded that he didn't know, that he had been told by Joseph that he and his son Joseph Thompson, had left to go foreign. To prove this, Robert brings forth a letter with a Liverpool postmark, purportedly written by Joseph, that says he and his son have left to travel to foreign parts, and that his cousin Robert is to stay at his farm and take care of it. Joseph's brother is not convinced that the letter is genuine but with nothing concrete stating otherwise, he has little option but to accept. The Discovery This is how things remain until November, when Joseph's only two pairs of boots are discovered in a waterway on the farm. Clothing is discovered, followed by the discovery of a hand. At Charter's farm some two miles away, Recently disturbed soil is discovered. Upon digging, they find the body of Joseph Wood, minus the hands and feet. 
From the Shields Daily Gazette, 13th of November, 1872. The Pickering Murders. Discovery of the Missing Bodies. Great excitement was occasioned in Pickering last night by the arrival of Superintendent Jonas and Inspector Nicholas with the body of Mr. Joseph Wood and his son Joseph, who it will be remembered disappeared together on the 18th of May last, and for whose murder a man named Robert Charter, cousin of the former, has been arrested and subsequently the son. Some remains of Mr. Wood's body were found buried a few days ago near the house where he lived in Cropton Lane, about six miles from Pickering, and from the position of the feet it seemed that the whole body had been buried there, but afterwards, when decomposed, had partly disinterred and removed. Having removed a haystack without result, Jonas and Mr. Nicholson set off to Lassingham to examine the fields in the occupation of Charter, the elder prisoner, who was living in Mr. Wood's house at the time of his disappearance. There, in what had been an old watercourse, the two officers noticed some fresh earth and set to work to examine the ground. At a depth of about two and a half feet, after removal of a quantity of stones which had been weathered and therefore not long buried, Mr. Jonas found a bag which contained Mr. Wood's body, head downwards, and smaller parts which are supposed to belong to the child. Wood had a neckerchief on and a rope around his neck. The officers had extreme difficulty exhuming the body in consequence of the great influx of water and the shoots of the new earth. A large oak tree had been laid over the place where the remains had been hidden. They were removed with the rest to Pickering and are capable of being identified. Yesterday also, Sergeant Wilkinson, who had traced the younger prisoner, returned from Castleford with documentary evidence of some value. It is thought the inquest cannot be held till Friday. With the discovery of remnants of what is supposed to be Joseph Wood and what looked like the bones of a child, intense efforts are made to discover the remains of young Joseph Thompson, the child who is also missing. Robert Charter is remanded and investigations are pursued regarding his actions and movements. It is discovered that his son-in-law, William Hardwick, had been seen with his father-in-law, Robert, to have been working in the fields around the time of the disappearance. William is also held, as grounds around Joseph's farmhouse are dug up and investigated. From the Shields Daily Gazette, 16th of November, 1872, The Cropton Murders. The police continued yesterday their search for the remains of the murdered child, Wood, at Cropton. A most important link in the chain of evidence against Robert Charter, the elder prisoner, has been obtained. His son-in-law, William Hardwick, was apprehended yesterday, charged with complicity in the murder of Joseph Wood and his child, and he voluntarily stated to the police that Charter came to his, Hardwick's house, on Monday night and wished him to take a letter to Liverpool. He took the letter, posted it on the following day at Liverpool, and it was addressed to Robert Charter, the elder prisoner. The all-important letter that had supposedly been sent by the missing Joseph Wood to his cousin Richard Charter at the farm on Crockton Lane had two purposes. It explained away Joseph and his son's disappearance, and it gave legitimacy to Richard to stay at Joseph's far more affluent farm to run it as he wished. 
The letter which Richard claimed to have he received was now discovered to have been written by Richard and given to his son-in-law William Hardwick in the dead of night around the time that Joseph had disappeared. This involved a long trip of some 200 miles by William to Liverpool to send the letter in order to get the Liverpool postmark. Richard, under remand, is now panicking. He makes two separate statements with two very different tellings of what had happened on the fateful night of Joseph's disappearance. From the Shields Daily Gazette, the 16th of November, 1872, The Cropton Murders. The inquest on the body of the murdered yeoman, Joseph Wood, in Crompton, was held at Pickering on Saturday before Mr. Ness, coroner. John and William Wood, brothers of the deceased, gave evidence as to the identity of the remains, as did his illegitimate daughter, Charlotte Ann Thompson, aged about 15, who spoke positively in reference to peculiarities apparent in the fragments of clothing attached to the body when found. Superintendent Jonas, who described the search by the police for the bodies of the murdered father and child and its result, produced and read two confessions made during the past week by the elder prisoner, Robert Charter, who, owing to his apparent physical prostration, was not present at the inquiry, but which obviously are f not full disclosures. In the first, the prisoner stated that on the night of the 17th of May, having heard a noise, he went out of the house and found Joseph Wood lying against a wall, dead and bloody, and that, fearing he himself would be suspected of having caused the death, he buried the body together with some small bones, which he thought were those of the missing boy, and which seemed to him to have been gnawed by pigs. The second statement was to the effect that on the night of the murder, Wood and he had a quarrel about some barley which the prisoner had brought from Lastingham to Crompton, that the deceased presented a gun at him and followed him into the garden, and that, in a struggle which followed, the prisoner seized a bar of iron that lay on the garden wall, and to kill the deceased gave him a blow on the head which caused his death. At the close of the inquiry, the jury returned a verdict of willful murder against the elder prisoner, Robert Charter. It was stated that he is suffering under deep depression and is so weak as to be unable to walk without assistance. As Richard and his son-in-law, William Hardwick, are held without bail, the police extend enormous efforts trying to find the missing body of eight-year-old Joseph Thompson. A discovery turns to horror when the evidence seems to suggest that Joseph Thompson had been fed to the pigs as had been hinted by Richard in one of his statements. From the Shields Daily Gazette, the 19th of November, 1872, The Cropton Murders, More Revolting Discoveries. The excitement created by the confession of the elder prisoner, Charter, having killed Joseph Wood, the father, whilst he denied having seen the son, had not subsided at Pickering on Sunday when a most startling discovery was made. It will be remembered that Charter referred to having found two bones of the boy in the fold yard and that he thought the pigs must have devoured him. This was generally thought to be a plain intimation of what had really become of the body of the child, and accordingly the search was diligently continued on the farm on Saturday and Sunday. On Sunday the police were rewarded for their trouble with a most remarkable discovery. The fields 
were gone over again, and at last, among some manure spread in a field, were found some bones, which on examination proved to be the right femur, the left tibia, and scapula of a young human being. That these bones are from the missing boy, no doubt, is entertained. The prisoner's suggestion that the lad had been devoured by the pigs now seems fully verified. From the, the appearance of the bones, it is now evidence that the body had not been boiled previous to the horrible means adopted for getting rid of it, but the probability is that after the death of the body was thrown to the pigs, the clothes being taken off. The marks on the bones plainly show them to have been gnawed by some animal. Another account, dated Pickering Monday 4.20pm, says, A report is currently that portions of ribs and some teeth and pieces of skull have been found on the farm supposed to belong to the murdered boy. It is ascertained that the manure among which the other bones were found did actually go from the piggery. The general impression is that Charter's conduct in reference to the child had been so shockingly atrocious that, though confessing to one murder, he cannot as yet bring his mind to confess all, but that in the first statement in his reference to the boy and the inference he draws from the alleged finding of the bones, he supplies the key to the solution of the child's fate. Attempts to discover the whole body of eight-year-old Joseph, as well as more evidence, continue in earnest as Richard sickens in jail. It would seem that the excrement from the pigs, which includes fragments of bone from young Joseph, has been used as manure in the fields as body parts are discovered within the manure that has been spread on the land. From the Shields Daily Gazette, the 23rd of November, 1872, The Cropton Murders. At Cropton, on Tuesday, a human tooth and a bone, supposed to have formed a part of an arm, were found in the pigsty attached to the farmhouse. They are believed to have belonged to the body of the murdered child of Joseph Wood. Further search for the murdered boy has been unproductive, but sufficient bones have now been found in the piggery and on the land scattered with the manure to show that human body had really been destroyed, in all probability, by the pigs. Corroborative scientific evidence has been obtained in London which settles the matter as to the bones being human, and such would answer to those of the missing boy. A telegram from Pickering on Saturday stated that the remains found on the farm at Cropton had been taken to York and examined by a skilled anatomists who declared them to be those of a boy of about nine or ten years old. Corroborative scientific testimony was also procured from London, and no doubt is entertained that they are the remains of the missing boy, son of the murdered man, Wood. The police were engaged in getting evidence for the examination of the prisoners Charter and Hardwick today before the North Riding Magistrate. The official inquiry before the magistrates takes place to confirm whether or not there is enough evidence to take Richard Charter and his son-in-law William Hardwick to trial. From the Scotsman, the 27th of November, 1872, The Cropton Murders. The inquiry regarding the Cropton murders was resumed at Pickering yesterday before a full bench of magistrates. On the previous night, there had been a great excitement in the town. The prisoners Charter and Hardwick were hooted by an excited crowd. Charter yesterday appeared to have gained confidence and was more cheerful. The town was comparatively quiet. 
The bench resumed evidence by hearing several witnesses who spoke to finding the bones apparently of a child amongst the manure in a field which had been led away from the small fold yard where the pigs had been. Superintendent Jonas then entered upon the whole history of the discovery of the clothes and a hand in the pond, the child's clothes in the house, the remains in the orchard, and subsequently the trunk in the ditch at Lastingham. He then detailed the arrest of Charter. He also stated that in Charter's house an envelope had been found with half a sheet of paper in a pocket book, exactly corresponding and fitting to the paper of the envelope of the Liverpool letter, saying that Mr. Wood had gone foreign. The watermarks also fitted, and the name of the makers, Howan and Sons. Witness read the voluntary statements made by the prisoner before the inquest, and he arrested Hardwick for being an accessory after the murder. On being arrested, Hardwick said, I know nothing at all about the murder. I only took the letter to Liverpool to post. Charter came to my house at Lastingham on Monday night, the 20th of May, and called me up and asked me if I would take a letter to Liverpool to the post. He said, have you any money? And I said, I had money. I took the letter from him and I went to Moulton the next day and I took the first train for Liverpool and posted it. I returned and got home late at night. I knew nothing of what was in the letter. I had nothing to do with the murder. Mr. Robert Wood, nephew of the deceased, gave evidence as to the finding of the bodies. Hannah Rosedale, who was a servant of Hardwick's, gave evidence as to Charter coming to Hardwick's house between 2 and 3 a.m. one day in May and asking him to come with him. Neither prisoners wished to ask questions, but Charter burst into tears and cried, Oh, my head! Joseph Harrison Walker, surgeon, gave medical evidence, saying the body might have been dead six or eight months. Mr. Dale had not closed the case for the prosecution and asked the bench to commit the prisoners for a trial at the next assizes at York, which was accordingly done. Both Richard and William are moved from the Pickering lock-up to York Castle to await trial. Whilst the move is taking place, the strong police contingency protects the prisoners from the massive crowd, hissing and shouting, Hang em! Also, whilst in prison, Richard's farm is auctioned off, selling everything that Richard owns, and, in essence, leaving his wife and children and his imprisoned son-in-law, William Hardwick, homeless. With the ill will that prevails against Richard, especially with the rumours that he had fed the little eight-year-old Joseph to the pigs, Richard discovers that the community have broken down what remains of his farm to rubble. The trial commences. Richard is physically frail, and Richard, in attempting to protect his son-in-law, William Hardwick, now tells a tale that he had stopped a passing traveller heading to Liverpool who had posted the letter he had written, basically giving Joseph's farm to him. From the Sheffield Daily Telegraph, 22nd of March, 1873, The Crockton Murders. Lord Chief Justice Beauville, the Grand Jury at the York Assizes, referred to the most serious charge of willful murder against Robert Charter. William Hardwick, his son-in-law, was also charged with being an accessory after the fact. His lordship then gave a resume of the principal facts of the case. After Charter was taken into custody, he made two statements. One of them was to the effect that he had found the deceased lying dead at the gate on the morning when he disappeared, and that he was afraid of being suspected 
and accused of murdering him, and that consequently he buried him under a heap of sticks where a portion of the remains were afterwards discovered. He afterwards dragged the body out of the place where it had been placed, portions of the body being taken to the beck where it was afterwards found. The other statement was that the prisoner had not found the deceased dead at the gate, but that the deceased at an early hour that morning had insisted on the prisoner's getting up and taking some barley back. But he had remonstrated that an altercation ensued with the deceased having a gun in his hand. The prisoner endeavoured to take it from him, and not being able to do so, Charter took a piece of iron and struck the deceased on the head. He thus managed to get possession of the gun which he took into the house, and when he came back, he found the deceased dead. Charter and Hardwick were seen in the fields adjoining the beck, which had been partly filled up, and where the body was found. Hardwick was ploughing at the time in the field, and at another time was seen in the lane with Charter, where the earth was being dug to carry down to the beck. With the initial summarization of the case reviewed, the trial commences in earnest. The prosecution decides to focus solely on the murder of Joseph Wood without pursuing the murder of eight-year-old Joseph Thompson, as there is not enough physical evidence to bring a charge against Richard for his murder. From the Shields Daily Gazette, the 26th of March, 1873, The Pickering Murders. The trial of Robert Charter, 53, and William Hardwick, 37, the former charged with murdering Joseph Wood, Farmer, and Cropton, and the latter with harbouring him, Charter, knowing him to have committed the said murder, commenced at 10 o'clock yesterday morning before Lord Chief Justice Beauville. A bill charging Charter with also having murdered a boy named Joseph Thompson, the illegitimate son of Joseph Wood, was ignored by the grand jury last Saturday. The gate of the castle was surrounded by a large crowd as early as nine o'clock, and the moment the door was thrown open to the general public, an excited rush took place in the entrance of the court in which every available seat and all standing room soon became occupied. About 1,000 disappointed applicants for admission remained standing outside. Mr. Maul, in opening the case for the prosecution, detailed with great clearness the circumstances of the case, stating that Joseph Wood had lived at Cropton, about five miles north of Pickering, in the East Riding. He had a farm at Cropton of about 80 acres, and at the time of his disappearance there were living in the same house with him the prisoner, Charter, who was his cousin, and Wood's two sons, Joseph Thompson, aged eight, and Thomas William, who was between four and five years old. The neighbours of the deceased comprised his two brothers, John and William, and Charter had a farm at Lastingham about two and a half miles from Cropton. On the 13th of May last, Joseph Wood and his son Joseph Thompson disappeared from the farm at Cropton and had not been seen or heard alive since. In reply to the inquiries of the deceased brother, Charter had said that during the night Joseph Wood called out to him from the bottom of the chamber stairs to say, that he and the boy were going away, and afterwards a letter was brought to the farm for Robert Charter. The prisoner asked the postman to open and read the letter, which he did. Then Charter took the letter to John Wood and asked him to read it, the purport of, of it being that Joseph Wood was going to take a ship and go foreign. The envelope bore the Liverpool postmark. The deceased brothers doubted the genuineness of this letter, but Charter 
was allowed to live at the farm until the middle of September, when he voluntarily offered to give up possession of the farm and arrangements for doing that were subsequently made. In the month of November following, the only two pairs of boots that deceased had possession were found. Then in a pond on the farm, parts of his clothing were found and also the left hand of a human being. Then the clothes of the boy Thompson were found in a tub behind the boiler house and his only pair of boots. Beneath a stick stack, a right hand and two human feet were found. Further search resulted in the discovery of a man's body, minus hands and feet, buried in a beck on Charter's farm. Human remains, supposed to be portions of the body of the boy, were afterwards found in some manure. The learned counsel also pointed out the improbabilities of Charter's confession, which was to the effect that Wood had attempted during an altercation to shoot him, and that he had struck in self-defence with the bar of iron, but knew nothing of the boy. He stated that it would be admitted that Hardwick had received the letter at the hands of the prisoner and had gone to Liverpool to post it. In doing this, he must have known that Charter had some sinister purpose in view in sending him to Liverpool with a letter addressed to himself. Moreover, it would be shown that the two prisoners were soon working together close to the beck on the farm where the body was found. The learned counsel spoke for an hour. John Wood was the first witness called and deposed to Charter, telling him on the 14th of May that his brother Joseph had gone away and had taken one of the boys with him. He said he did not know where he had gone, and when the witness told him he ought to have asked him, he replied that he did not think it was his business to ask. His brother said Charter had shouted from the stairs bottom two or three times that they were going away, and that he was to stay at the farm. As soon as he waked up, he said he had come downstairs and gone into Crockton Lane to see if he could see aught of them, but could not, as it was dark. Witness asked him what time that was, and when replying three o'clock, witness told him he didn't think it could have been very dark at that time, and that might he have seen him. Then Charter said the clock was stopped, and it might not be so late. Witness told him that he ought to have let him and his brothers know, as Joseph was odd and queer in his ways, to which Charter responded that he had been very nice since he had gone to the farm. More witnesses are brought forward that confirm the outline of the prosecution's case. On the last day of the trial, the medical evidence is brought forward proving how Joseph Wood had died. From the Shields Daily Gazette, the 27th of March, 1873, the Cropton murder case, verdict of manslaughter. Yesterday, the trial of Robert Joseph, 53, farmer, and William Hardwick, 37, farm labourer, the former for the murder of Joseph Wood, at his farm at Crockton in the North Riding, the latter, for being an accessory after the fact, was resumed at York. The court was again crowded, and the public interest in this remarkable trial unabated. The evidence of the finding of the bones, said to be those of the missing boy, was gone into. They were found on a manure heap on the farm, which had been carted from the pigsty. Mr. Joseph Hampson Walker, surgeon in Pickering, deposed to the examination of the body of Joseph Wood at the Pickering Police Station. Some sensation was created in court by the witness producing the battered skull of the man and the gnawed bones of the boy. 
at the back and towards the top of the skull there was a crack of about one and three quarter inches in length going through the substance of the skull which must have been done by a violent blow with some blunt instrument there was a large fracture running across the left temple and also a longitudinal and angular fracture in line with it several little pieces of bone had been driven in there were indications of eruptions of blood and two such blows as must have inflicted those injuries would cause anybody's death witness was certain that the wounds had been caused before death the cheek bones were also broken and the bar of iron now produced was very likely to have caused those injuries the small bones produced were those of a person from eight to ten years of age they were a child's leg bone thigh bone and shoulder blade a vertebrae and two ribs the leg and thigh bones appear to have been gnawed by animals the man's hand was clasped and in it was a human hair like that of the prisoner charter dr proctor in york agreed with the evidence of the previous witness mr w schofield surgeon and with w bird surgeon in york and gave corroborative evidence this closed the case for the prosecution mr waddy on behalf of hardwick asked the learned judge whether the balance of testimony was not in favour of the expultation of hardwick and whether there were really sufficient evidence put to him mr waddy to the necessity of troubling the lord chief justice and the jury his lordship said there was no direct evidence that knew about it but there was this that he was seen about in some fields accompanied by charter and his lordship was of the opinion that the case against hardwick must go to the jury a great deal of what hardwick had done was consistent with his relationship to charter his father-in-law but at the same time it was not inconsistent that hardwick should have been employed to throw dust in the eyes of joseph wood's relation mr digby seymour gave an eloquent appeal to the jury in defense of charter he suggested that charter's story was true and that the whole matter was done in the heat of a quarrel and implored the jury to cast all sensational consideration of the boy aside and prayed that they might arrive at a just and riotous decision the jury returned a verdict against charter of the minor offence of manslaughter and he was sentenced to twenty years penal servitude hardwick was found not guilty and was accordingly acquitted postscript charter spent part of his sentence at parkhurst prison on the isle of wight after his release he returned to yorkshire to find he had nothing his property had not only been sold but had been demolished that concludes this episode of frightful fridays the cropton murders we very much hope you enjoyed the show if you did enjoy this show we would be grateful if you could like or subscribe to our channel we upload five days a week mondays are murderous as we delve into the dark side of regency and victorian crime wednesdays are wicked where we pull together stories with a similar theme such as doctors of death fridays are frightful where we look at crimes in a location such as stories from the stage to murder and scandal in the aristocracy saturdays is serial killer saturdays where we investigate serial killer stories from the past and Sundays is a bit of fun, with a unique mini-murder mystery where you, the listener, have a chance to solve a murderous riddle. On the last Sunday of the month, we offer a two-hour compilation of stories based around a theme. If you like this channel, you may be interested in our sister channel, 
Chronicle of the Times, where we offer a lighter side of Victorian and Edwardian news stories, as well as a weekly podcast of stories from authors of the day, such as Dickens, Collins, Benson and Conan Doyle. Thank you again for watching and listening. This has been News of the Times, and I am Robin Coles.